sunshine outside, so I'm glad that you have survived this wet week and the storms and the wind and all of that other stuff, and the Lord has blessed us that we're able to be out to his house today. And we're blessed to have Bobby to play an instrumental for us on the piano. Thank you, Mr. Bobby Anderson. That was beautiful music, and I know you enjoyed hearing that. Well, I checked our birthday list, and I did not see anyone this past week that had a birthday. I know we got some real special people that are having birthdays this coming week. Right, James? Okay. And uh, so let's remember to thank the Lord for every day as it is a gift from God. I was thinking on the way to church this morning. There's people that have lots of money that would give a lot of money to be able to come to the Lord's house, and I often take it for granted, and I ask the Lord to remind me of so many undeserved blessings. On our prayer request list this morning, continue to remember Brother Jerry Strader as he has his treatments. He was telling me about those the other day, and uh, almost got me to feeling bad just listening to what he has to go through. So again, I'm thankful that the Lord has spared me from that, but pray that Brother Jerry will uh, do real well with these treatments and that they'll be 100% successful. I was prepared this morning. Sometimes uh, things change. I was prepared to tell you that Mrs. Annie Vault was recovering nicely and uh, planned on being with us in service soon. But boy, she walked right in the door with that usual big smile on her face. So it is so good to see her and glad that the Lord has blessed her physically and pray that the Lord will continue to strengthen her. Daryl was talking to me about cities and towns this morning. And Miss Ann and I know of a place in Virginia that very few people have heard of, and that is Cripple Creek, Virginia. How many of you know where Cripple Creek, Virginia is? Okay. Daryl says he's heard of it. Well, it's in the area of Galax and Independence and then Fries. Now, they spell Fries, F-R-I-E-S. If you're not from around there, you would think that's the way it is, but they actually pronounce it Freeze. So you go from Galax to Independence to Freeze, and then right on the other side of Freeze, near the New River, is this little place called Cripple Creek. You might want to Google it sometime and take a trip up there. Who knows? But uh, let's be much in prayer for our services today, our teacher, our pastor. 
uh, Brother Archie, as he comes to sing for us tonight, that everything that's said and done today will magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have a request that you'd like for us to remember in prayer? The Lord sees, the Lord knows. Darrell, would you pray for us, please, sir? This morning, our scripture reading in the Old Testament from the book of Joel, if you don't have a thumb index Bible, and if uh, I confess sometimes when somebody says turn to some of these minor prophets, I know kind of where they are, but if you're familiar with Daniel, go to Daniel and then go to your right two books, and there is Joel. Joel chapter 2, begin by reading verses 18 through 27. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face towards the east sea and his hinder part towards the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O Lamb, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, nor the pastors of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain, in the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I send among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. This book of Joel was written some 2,800 years ago, around 800 B.C. Names in the Bible mean something. This name, Joel, means Jehovah is God. His message from God to the people then is concerned primarily with Jerusalem and Judah. Simon Peter quoted from Joel on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and he made the statement that what was taking place then was a fulfillment of what Joel had prophesied some 800 years earlier. There are two main events in the book of Joel that he focuses on. The first deals with the locust plague and the drought that comes upon Judah, and you can read that in detail in Joel chapter 1. And then the second event that we didn't read, that we stopped reading right before 
That portion of Scripture is in Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. Those are perhaps the best or most familiar verses in this short three-chapter book. Our pastor has been speaking for some time on Sunday mornings about uh, Revelation, and it outlines a great deal the judgment of God that will be poured out on planet Earth in a future time that you and I call the tribulation. But in the day of Joel, the plague of locusts was devastating on the agricultural people. If you can just stop and get this picture in your mind, locusts covered the earth for several miles and the crops just disappeared. I mean, the vegetation, the trees and the plants were stripped of their bark and leaves. God can use whatever he chooses at his disposal to send judgment. He can use forces of nature such as an earthquake, a flood, lightning strikes, hurricanes, tornadoes, or other kinds of disasters to make his judgment effective. The Jews in that day were familiar with locusts because Moses had prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that God would in fact use locusts to punish his people that were disobedient. Now growing up as a kid, my wonderful, loving, kind dad on more than one occasion would take me to the basement at the house that we lived in and that was never a pleasant time to administer corporal punishment. And he told me his actions were out of a heart of love and they were ultimately in my best interest because they were designed to change bad behavior. Now I had a tough time swallowing all of that at that particular time, but later on I realized he was 100% right. And that is the same reason that God sent judgment in the day of Joel because God's action on the form of locusts upon his chosen people were sent to them to remedy their faults and sins. And the ultimate goal was not just to punish the people, but it was to restore fellowship. So when God sends divine judgment upon a nation or a group of people, the only right reaction that people can do is mourn and repent. Pray to God as He alone is the only recourse for relief. Now perhaps sometimes people need an attention-getting device. Did you use an attention-getting device to wake you up this morning? I had an alarm clock set at our house, but I woke up about 15 or 20 minutes before that thing went off. But we sometimes need things to wake us out of our slumber. Joel said in chapter 2, verse 1, blow a trumpet and sound an alarm. When we have a crisis in our land, and I believe we do today, uh, we're in a serious situation. Joel says in verse 11 of chapter 2, Nature is not out of control, but that army of locusts that will be sent, they are marching under God's orders and at His specific command. You and I as human beings are the only thing in God's creation that does not march to His orders. We have choices and sadly we often make the wrong choice. I personally have an opinion this morning that trumpets are sounding all across the United States of America in the day in which you and I are living. When the president of our country appears more sympathetic to other religions such as Muslim than he is to Christianity, to me that is the sounding of a trumpet. When gay marriage is legal by the laws of our land, the horn is definitely sounding. When laws are passed 
that tell us which restroom to use in a public place, to me the trumpet is blaring loudly. Why are we where we are today? The same reason that God was sending locusts on Judah in the day of Joel. God's people had turned from him and were living in sin. Can we examine this morning the first of three points that I'd like to call to your attention? Can we look at Joel chapter 2 and read verses 12 through 13 and talk about the duty of the people? In Joel 2.12, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even unto me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. Those two verses are an invitation from God to His people to turn. The warning is obvious. If you need to turn, you're going the wrong way, right? Don't we often read in the paper about someone getting turned around on the interstate in our area and going the wrong way and having a head-on collision and getting injured seriously or losing their life? The direction of our country today in the majority is that folks appear to be going the wrong way. It's a direction that is opposite from what saith the Word of God. Repentance is first inward and it's intangible. But once you make things right with the Lord, an individual truly repents, the fruit of that repentance will be visible outward. Joel gave us three good sources to pursue if we are sorry for our sins, and those three are fasting, weeping, and mourning. Now, fasting is not often practiced in our day because it calls for denying our flesh. And so many in our day seem to be living their lives seeking only to satisfy, not deny themselves. I thought about weeping, and I got to thinking about myself. We see a lot of people weeping in our day, but it's not always spiritually related. People weep when their ball team loses a the game. They'll show shots in the stand, and players are crying, and the fans are crying. Most of you know I'm a sports fan, and the Yankees have been in last place most of this current season. I haven't cried over them yet, but I have kind of mumbled and grumbled about them. But I will say on a positive note, they've won their last four games and they're a half a game out of last place. So business is picking up. People weep when their favorite character gets killed off of a television series. They weep over movies. My wife has watched this one movie about a dozen times, and honest to goodness, she knows what's going to take place, but every time she still cries, and you can ask her sometime if she wants to share with you what the name of that movie is. People weep over their financial statement when things are going south on Wall Street, but I'm thinking I've got about eight or ten people that I regularly pray for. And they're either lost or they're out of the Lord's will. And I pray for them daily. They're mostly family related or connected to the family or sometimes people in the church. And I think I care enough about them to ask the Lord to send the Holy Spirit and convict them and turn them. But I don't weep over them. And that's sad that I'm at condition. Pray for me that the Lord will give me a greater burden. I was thinking of Pastor Bobby Robertson up at Gospel Light Baptist Church. He has a large church and he's preached in churches all across our great country. But you know the one factor that most likely separates him and his ministry? He's able to talk to people that are lost or out of the Lord's will and he's able to weep over them. You've heard that old statement and I think it's applicable again. People don't care how much you know until they know how much 
you care. So I need to weep over my condition this morning. I need to weep over family members and friends that are not in the right relationship with the Lord. And certainly I need to weep over my country. Joel is telling Judah that we can weep now and rejoice later. That's a promise of God and that's certainly a good one. More now so that we can be comforted later. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Jesus said again in Luke 6, 21, Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. So if we're not content, with the way things are going in our neck of the woods, we don't have to sit around and twiddle our thumbs and curse the darkness. Joel says it is our duty to fast, to weep, and to mourn. And then verse 13 of Joel 2 goes even further. It gives us instructions to rend our heart. It was customary for the Jews in that day They expressed their grief or sorrow over an event in their country, over a death or a sickness, by tearing the outer garment that they wore. God is saying through the prophet Joel that tearing up fabric is an exercise in futility unless the heart is broken and contrition is evident. If we are truly sorry for our sins, Joel is recommending we turn, we fast, we weep, and we mourn. Those are actions that show we mean business. We're turning from our sin to God. It's high time that I wake up from my careless indifference. We're too often poster children for the Laodicean church. We're rich, we're increased with goods, We have need of nothing. That's just our opinion. But God says our real condition in our day is a five-word description. He says we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He says if we want to hear from Him, what have we been talking about since the last Sunday in January of this year? Open our ears to what the Spirit is telling us from the Bible and from men of God. And that brings me to the next point to consider. Men and women have a duty individually to examine ourselves and turn to God. The reason He is the only one who can help us. Regardless, folks, of who's elected president in the upcoming election, your and I hope as believers is based on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. Read with me if you're still in Joel chapter 2, verse 17. And this is what I want to examine next. We've talked about the duty of the people. Let's look at the duty of the priest, or in our case, the duty of the preachers. Verse 17 says, Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say... Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage, notice that word heritage, to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? So if things are going to turn around in our land today, God's men have a duty. God's men then and now are mediators between God and the people. The attitude of God's men here is sorrow and repentance as they lead the people. Joel is writing about the same thing that Ezekiel wrote about in Ezekiel 8, 16. Within the inner court of the Lord's house in those days, near the entrance to the door of the temple, there was a place where the priests could stop. And they didn't say, not Lord, But write us, not write us, Lord, but spare us. Men of God, as Joel did then and now, need to remind us of a lost heritage. You and I live in what used to be known as the Bible Belt of the country. When I was a teen, Dad would regularly schedule a revival meeting with a local pastor for two weeks 
And then the preacher would say, hold the third week open in case the Lord starts moving in the midst. Well, you know, in our day, most pastors don't even schedule revival meetings because the congregation won't attend. But it don't have to be that way. This past Monday night, my wife and I went to a revival meeting at the New Hope Baptist Church below Elon College where Brother Randy Hobbs is the pastor. That was the second week of this meeting. The place was so crowded Monday night that Pastor Randy Hobbs said for the first time in his many years as pastor, and I know he goes back at least to 1988, that's the first time that he's ever been nervous about where people were going to sit. Every seat in the pew was full. Folding chairs were everywhere. They even brought folding chairs up on the pulpit and had preachers to sit up there. There were no parking spaces left in the church parking lot. On the side road, people were parked all up and down that road. There were 48 preachers in attendance at that service on Monday night. Why? Because word had got out that God was moving in the midst there. I believe those preachers that came from as far away as Danville, Virginia, and other places, they want to do what Joel is encouraging here. They want to see the moving of God among this people. Last Sunday, a man at New Hope Baptist Church that is described as a roughneck that they have been praying for for many years came to the altar and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Men have announced their call to preach in that meeting. This past Thursday night, at least 16 or more people were saved in the service. That meeting goes on Monday and Tuesday night of this upcoming week. The point that I'm getting to is we are talking about our heritage. Did you know that the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same Yesterday, today, and forevermore. Thankfully, we have a man of God here at Charity Baptist Church who proclaims the whole counsel of God. And he preaches out of a heart of love, wanting to see the lost saved, and he wants to see those that are walking a far distance from God back in fellowship with him. But you know, perhaps the one factor that I appreciate the most about him is he puts up with me. Can I get several amen, amen right there? But it is good that we can meet together with a man of God. But here's the key, and this is the sobering part. Things can change so quickly from one generation to the next. It did for the Israelites. Did you know when they first entered the promised land with Joshua being the leader? Think of all the mighty acts of God those people had seen God do on their behalf. They were blessed, obviously. They had seen with their eyes, they had heard with their ears, and they believed. But here's what happened in Judges 2.10. It says, then arose, after that generation that entered the promised land, there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Did you know the next generation then, and it may be happening in our day, they can turn aside to worship other gods, and they do not make their parents' faith, their own faith. No generation can live off the faith of a previous generation. Every generation and every individual needs a first-hand faith. Well, I've talked about the duty of the people. I've discussed the duty of the preacher. But here's the part that I really want to focus on. And my final point is the desire of God. Go back to that verse we read earlier. I, I left out the last part of verse 13 in chapter 2. And it reads, speaking of God, for He 
is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of evil. If you were noticing when I began this morning by reading verses 18 through 27 of Joel chapter 2, it went into great detail of God's response when and if his people will repent of their sins. He promises them if they will turn from their sin to him, he will Bless them greatly. Isn't that good? He don't make you apologize for all those years you were doing things wrong. He just welcomes you back like the father did the prodigal son and begins to bless you. I was uh, hearing a story a couple of weeks ago that I had to chuckle about. My wife had a principal in school for several years Some of you may have heard of him, Mr. Clendenin. His son works at the Sheriff's Department. Mr. Clendenin was a disciplinarian. He walked the halls at Page High School with a yardstick. Any person that got out of line, and in those days it was usually the boys, he would whack them with his yardstick. And what I thought was humorous about that was in our day, if a principal in a public school whacked a student with a yardstick, the parents would call for him to be fired immediately, if not sooner, as they were on their way to their lawyer's office to file a lawsuit. But I told you that story about Mr. Clendenin to relate it to God. A lot of people seem to think that God is just looking down on us, waiting for us to mess up. And when we do, he's going to zap us with that yardstick or send a lightning bolt to punish us. But if you read the Bible, that's really the opposite of what God is. He is gracious and loving and kind. Uh, If you look at his attributes and you think about yourself, and when I examine myself, I'm amazed that God has put up with me for so many years because I know me. I know how much I fail Him. I know how much I come short of His glory. I know about things that I should be doing that I'm not doing. I know also about things that I am doing that I need to stop doing. God is holy while I am often sinful. God is impartial but I'm not regularly that way. God is long-suffering, but I often come up short on patience. My middle name, it begins with the initial P, but my wife can assure you that doesn't stand for patience. You know, I tend to love the folks that love me and treat me nice, but God loves everybody, even His enemy. God is a God of mercy, and I often in the flesh want to take matters into my own hands when dealing with people who have not lived up with my expectations for them. I heard a well-known preacher, and I had to chuckle when he said this the other week. He said, I'm glad the Lord doesn't always answer my prayers as I pray them. He said, I can just see the Holy Spirit, and I thought about me, saying to God, oh, Ray's messing up again. He don't really mean this. This is really what he means. But this preacher said he's glad the Lord doesn't answer all the prayers that he prays because he said the population where he lived in Tennessee, that area would be smaller instead of larger. And he said even some members of his church wouldn't be in attendance anymore because they would be out in the cemetery. And then he laughed when he said that. But I'm thankful that God doesn't always answer our prayers. God is patient, and I'm often impatient, but His ways are higher than our ways. Folks, can I say in conclusion this morning, when we examine ourselves, speaking for me, I'm often amazed at God's patience that He tolerates me and my ways over the years. But I look at Him And I think about his loving and his kind attributes. And I can only say 
that you and I that have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we serve a great, big, wonderful God. A God who loves every one of us. A God who has been so good to all of us. I salute heaven this morning for my heritage. I'm glad that I was raised in a Christian home. I have been around a lot of people in my life, but my father is the best Christian that I've ever been associated with. At 86 years old, God is still using him to proclaim the gospel. I'm glad for a godly mother who was one of the best preacher's wives, in addition to being one of the best mothers that you could ever find. I'm glad my son and grandkids are in church this morning. And my heart's desire is that the Lord will work in their lives. For my grandkids, I tell them on a regular basis, I love you, I thank the Lord for you, and I pray for them every day, not that they'll be some accomplished musician or actor or ball player, but they will first put the Lord in their life and seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Well, in closing, can you and I join with the prophet Joel and desire that God will restore our Christian heritage in our area of the world. And may you and I also personally be willing to be accountable and turn to God with all our hearts. You know that old song? It's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. May we even be willing to do what Joel said to take an additional responsibility to fast, to weep, and to mourn about our personal condition as well as for the condition of our country. Let's stand and be dismissed. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you as we read this encouraging account in Joel. Even though people sin and go astray, you're a good God, you're a loving God, you're a kind God. You're willing to accept people back and to reform, restore fellowship with them and to bless them. And, and what a at, wonderful attribute that is. Help me, Lord, to be more Christ-like and less like myself that I may do as Joel recommended strongly, follow this example of weeping and fasting and mourning. And Lord, in our own congregation, may we see people that we are concerned about that are lost. May we see them saved. May we see people that walk a far distance from you that we're concerned about. May we see them in church and following your will for their lives. In the upcoming service, I pray that every song that's sung the message from our pastor will be exactly what we stand in need of. I pray if there's any in our midst today that's lost, that's never been born again, that this would be their day of salvation, I ask, in the name that's above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.